and this is just a panel, you know, a, a second panel today that I'm at least aware of on, on sexual violence and genocide and kind of very, very serious issues and understudied and under-discussed issues that that, um, that, that represents. Um, there was a great panel today for those who were not able to be there. Um, it was chaired by Marina Goldenberg, and, and I think you'll be able to maybe at some point in the discussion bring some of those very important issues that were raised today into it. So, who wants to go first? Um, my name is Elisa Fugger for me, and I am at the University of Pennsylvania the Department of History there. Um, and the title of my talk today is The Missing Link, Gender and the Early Warning System. Um, and the purpose of my presentation today is to point out some of the ways that gender analysis can help with the, constructive of, the construction of an effective early warning system. Up to now, most of the work on gender and genocide studies um, has focused on the experience of victims and the prosecution of perpetrators. And both of these bodies of literature have been very important, I think, in beginning to help us redefine and think about genocide in new ways and to incorporate the gender variable, what we call the gender variable, into our um, definitions of the crime as well as into our thinking about the prevention of genocide, both in the long and the short term. Now, an important um, new sort of, what would you say, new tendency in the study of genocide um, as a, um, the study of gender as, as a contributor to our thinking about the prevention of genocide is the work of Adam Jones, whose work on gender side has identified many things, but in particular, particular to an early warning system, he has identified the sex-selective massacre of men as a, as a warning side of um, full-scale, a coming full-scale root and branch genocide. And his research has shown that men are frequently killed first in the genocidal process. Um, there are many reasons for this. This can be so because men are construed as posing a potential violent threat to the genocide bears because they are a battle age. Um, it can be true because social norms make it easier for perpetrators to kill men than women and children, so the killing of men is used as a way to um, inculcate, right, or prepare the perpetrators to then begin to kill women and children. And it can be true because men are seen as the symbolic heads of the social order, occupying um, important positions in the public and private life of groups, so killing men is a way of decapitating and therefore sowing chaos within a group. Um, and Jones's work has shown that analysts really need to pay attention to the gender variable when interpreting conflict as it unfolds on the ground in front of us. Now, of course, the neglect of this gender variable in prevention efforts is rapidly being overcome. If one looks, um, and, and Henry just mentioned this, but if one looks at the number of panels at this conference that deal with sexual violence, during genocide, for example, I think we see, and we're beginning to see how important gender is to the implementation of genocides. And we are increasingly recognizing that genocide is a very gendered process. And I would argue that genocide can be said to be inherently gendered. Um, and this is because the crime is at its core, and this is something Helen Fry pointed out in 1999, but the crime is at its core about the prevention of the future reproduction of a group or set of groups. And this reproductive process is universally understood in gender terms. Perpetrators of genocide follow a pattern of attack that seeks to obliterate all institutions and symbols of reproduction, which they understand in political, social, biological, and then also in metaphysical terms. So perpetrators pursue destruction on all of these levels. But each destructive act, I'm submitting, um, is tied to the other by its focus on the generative powers of the group. And this is something, these systematic attacks on symbols and institutions of a group's generative power is something I call life force atrocity. And what I mean by this is a ritualized pattern of violence that targets the life force of a group by destroying both the physical symbols of the life force as well as the group's most basic institutions of reproduction and particularly the family unit. Life force atrocity includes sexual violence. The sexual violence is usually a part of life force atrocity, but it also extends to acts of violence that go well beyond um, sexual violence. And I'll talk about that in a moment. 
Now, life force atrocities, um, at least in my study of them, fall into two general categories. First, or the first is inversion rituals. I call it virgin rituals that seek to reverse proper hierarchies and relationships within families and communities, and thereby to destroy the sacred bonds that give our lives purpose and meaning. Such acts include forcing family members to watch the rape, torture, and murder of their loved ones, and forcing them to participate in the perpetration of these crimes. Common versions of such atrocities include fathers being forced to rape their children, mothers being forced to kill their children, children being forced to kill their parents, brothers being forced to rape and kill their sisters, um, children being pulled screaming from their parents' arms to be killed, and parents being forced to watch as their children are slowly tortured and murdered. Now the second type of, or the second category of genocidal atrocity, which is related to the first, is the ritual mutilation and desecration of symbols of group reproduction, which includes male and female reproductive organs, women's breasts as the site of life-giving milk of lactation, pregnant women as the loci of generative powers, and infants and small children as the sacred symbols of the group's future. Now, what ties these two categories of life force atrocity together is that in each, Perpetrators betray a pronounced obsession with the destruction of that life force of the group, that untouchable, invisible life force of the group. Not just the group's biological ability to bring children into the world, but also those structures of tenderness, love, protectiveness, and loyalty that, in the final analysis, act to sustain family and community life. Um, and I believe that these atrocities enact the logic that is at the core of the crime of genocide. They are genocide writ small, microcosms of the larger process. When we can identify a pattern of life force atrocity in a conflict, we can be almost certain that a genocidal logic exists at some level of the perpetrator hierarchy. While a full-scale root and branch genocide may not yet be in progress, life force atrocities should signal to the international community the threat that genocidal violence exists in a conflict, that it will spread and become further systematized in a process of radicalization which can and often does end up resulting in the phenomenon that we call a genocide. Now I want to cite one example of what I'm calling life force atrocity, an example that combines both of the categories I have just described and illustrates the way that these rituals can betray the mindset of the perpetrators. Um, a UN observer who was present during the Rwandan genocide tells us that, this is a quote from his book, the Interahamwe made a habit of killing young Tutsi children in front of their parents by first cutting off one arm and then the other. They would then gash the neck with a machete to bleed the child slowly to death, but while they were still alive, they would cut off the private parts and throw them in the faces of the terrified parents who would then be murdered with slightly greater dispatch. Now in this terrible example, we have an inversion ritual, which is forcing parents to watch helplessly while the genocidaires commit such acts against their children, and ritual mutilation of symbols of generation, the cutting off of children's genitals. Perpetrators here are using the victim's body and the bodies and the roles that these bodies are seen to play in the reproductive process as a means of sending a message to the victims, to other perpetrators, and really to the invisible audience of the world at large, and they are telling us that their goal is not just the massacre of the individuals within the group, but also the permanent obliteration of the sacred forces that make the lives of these individuals possible, sustainable, and meaningful. Now, life force atrocities can be found in different versions um, in all commonly recognized genocides across de vastly different time periods and cultures. Um, but they are also found in conflicts that are not generally recognized as genocidal or composed, they're comprising a genocide, such as Japan's sex slavery system, 
during World War II, um, the former war, civil war in Sierra Leone, and the current war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I will return to this fact at the end of my presentation, although I should say that the two other presenters will also be discussing this in their presentations, which is really quite exciting. Um, what I want to point out here is that in both inversion rituals and ritual desecrations, the perpetrators instrumentalize victims based on their perceived position within the reproductive process. So they torture and kill women and men, girls and boys, relationally, in order to inflict maximum spiritual, psychic, and emotional damage on families and communities. So men are often targeted not simply as men, but as fathers, sons, brothers, um, and, and husbands. And women there are also targeted as mothers, daughters, wives, and as sisters. Girls and boys are killed as children, as the beloved children of parents. Infants of both genders are killed as the most sacred symbols of the group's um, future. And in fact, in many genocides, in most genocides, in fact, particularly horrific tortures are reserved precisely for infants. Um, and I believe that's for this reason. So perpetrators play on social roles, reproductive social, social roles in the reproductive process in the ritualized tortures they devise in the process of killing. Um, but it needs to be noted that a relational and gendered logic is to, extends to many forms of genocidal uh, violence that do not involve murder. And I, in fact, I think we tend to focus a little too much on killing and numbers of dead in our definitions um, and our determinations of genocide. Left to run its course, indeed, genocide will take the lives of hundreds of thousands, millions of people. But the crime of genocide involves so much more than that, and I think we see that from the testimony of survivors and the challenges they have, the trauma that they face afterwards. So for example, rape, as we know, is a common tool of genocide. Frequently, it is used as a means of killing, as a way of torturing the victims to death, so it's part of the killing process. But it is also genocidal when the victim is allowed to live, to go on living. It, is, um, it can be genocidal when it is used to force a woman to bear children from the perpetrator group, for example, or when it is committed with such savagery as to permanently compromise both physically and psychically um, a woman's reproductive functions and ability to reproduce. It can be genocidal when it is ritually enacted to torture entire families or communities, as when it is committed in public, when a family member is forced to commit the rape, or when family members are forced to witness the rape. Um, other forms of sexual violence can also be part of a genocidal campaign, such as the beating of men on, gen on their genitals um, and forced castrations, which is another common torture used during genocide. Often when perpetrators of genocide overtake a village or town, um, they will pursue a pattern of destruction that includes many different types of life force atrocities. Now, my, the focus of my current research is on how these life force atrocities can help us identify genocide early on and distinguish it then from, from the civil conflicts, political repression, and interstate wars for which genocide is often confused. And I think this is important because genocide operates differently than these other phenomena. It is a particular process unto itself. Um, and it usually proves itself to be impervious to more conventional forms of diplomacy and intervention. Genocide also tends to spread very rapidly as perpetrators incorporate new victim groups and take the violence to a regional level. So it is important, I think, for us to know early on in a conflict if there is genocidal violence, if there is a threat of genocide, and where this threat exists in a chain of now, currently, life force atrocities tend to get categorized by reporting agencies under the more general rubric of atrocities against civilians. So one of our key indicators, or what I'm proposing as one of our key indicators, of the presence of genocidal violence is getting lost within the fog of war. Um, part of the reason for this is that there is not much public recognition that the organic communities that are targeted by genocide 
are frequently targeted in gendered ways that can mimic conventional warfare, but that do in fact follow a different logic. Um, to go back to the example of rape, rape is a common crime committed against women in times of war. It is also a common crime committed against women in times of genocide. Um, but at the early stages of what we later find out was in fact a genocidal process, rapes are not understood to be evidence of genocide and are generally assumed to just be evidence of war. Um, now, the debate about what constitutes specifically genocidal rape has tended to focus on forced maternity. And this is something that is obviously very difficult to prove in the early stages of a genocide. In many cases, however, we can determine, I believe, that genocide, I mean, that rape is a part of a larger genocidal process by placing the crime back in its narrative context. Um, let me give an example. In a well-known testimonial from a Congolese woman named Nadine, recorded by the playwright Eve Ensler in 2007, Nadine tells us about the attack on her village. And this is what she says. I'm 29, she begins. I am from the village of Ninja. Normally there was insecurity in our area. We would hide many nights in the bush. The soldiers found us there. They killed our village chief and his children. We were 50 women. I was with my three children and my older brother. They told my older brother to have sex with me. He refused, so they cut his head, and he died. Then Ensler writes, Nadine's body is trembling. It is hard to believe these words are coming out of a woman who is still alive and breathing. She tells me how one of the soldiers forced her to drink his urine and eat his feces, how the soldiers killed 10 of her friends and then murdered her own children, her four-year-old and two-year-old boys, and her one-year-old girl. They flung my baby's body on the ground like she was garbage, Nadine says. One after another, they raped me. From that, my vagina and anus were ripped apart. One of the soldiers cut open a pregnant woman. It was a mature baby, and they killed it. They cooked it, and they forced us to eat it. Now, patterns of atrocities like the ones witnessed and suffered by Nadine strongly suggest that the perpetrators, at some level of the hierarchy, have developed genocidal intent against some kind of group that they're defining. Although Nadine's story is enclosed within the story about rape, um, the crimes and the victims far exceed the word. There are her three murdered children, the pregnant woman and her unborn baby, Nadine's brother, the village chief and his entire family, and ten of her friends. There are the inversion rituals and the ritual desecrations, the initial targeting of the village chief and his family when the perpetrators arrive, the attempt to force Nadine's brother to rape her, the evisceration of a pregnant woman, the forced cannibalism of an unborn child. Now, similar life force atrocities were the norm in attacks on villages during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. And this suggests the possibility that perpetrators can form genocidal intent against civilian communities as such. Their destruction is focused on the civilian group as that self-reproducing unit that, um, that needs to be, in their minds, annihilated. Um, and whatever the case, and I think more research needs to be done on what this means, what this overlap of life voice atrocities in full-scale sort of total genocides, ideological genocides, and in, in, in less clear cases of genocides, when we're using the genocide convention definition. Um, so need, more, more research needs to be done. But in any case, the presence of genocidal life force atrocities can indeed alert us to the fact that violence has taken on a particularly extreme form, that odds are it will not be self-limiting, that it has become, the, 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 the conflict has become tremendously asymmetrical and require a rapid coordination of international and regional efforts in order for it to stop. Now, um, in closing, I want to say that when life force atrocities are recorded or are decontextualized as general atrocities against civilians, they're often broken down or disaggregated in ways that are artificial to the original crime and that can lead to the obscuring of the fact that the original atrocities were part of an integrated process 
of relational violence expressed in inversion rituals and ritual desecrations. So in the attack on Nadine's village, we could sort of we could report the crimes based on gender or age, right, or rape and killing, right, or the types of crimes. But if we don't see them as a whole, as they're presented in the narrative, we lose, I think, a piece of the puzzle. We lose a sense of what this violence, um, at least in her village, was about. So my research on life force atrocities is therefore aimed particularly at the humanitarian aid workers, human rights activists, intelligence analysts, and journalists who are often the first responders when information about violence is filtering in. They can go far in determining how violence gets framed. And the more clear information we can give them about how to interpret events as genocide or as threatening genocide or potentially genocidal, um, the stronger will be the political ability, right? Not the political will, perhaps, but certainly the political ability to do something about it or to begin to construct effective means of intervening in it. So keeping an eye out for gendered life force atrocities is, in my mind, a concrete and empirical way to read a potential genocide through the type of violence being inflicted on communities early on in conflict situations. The presence of life force atrocities also allows us to infer possible intent on the part of perpetrators, identify a group that is being threatened with potential genocide, and determine where that threat is, at least in the immediate context, coming from. Now, this empirical evidence does not rely on high numbers of dead or statements and other hard-to-find documents during a conflict from the perpetrators. It can be, it can be identified early on in a conflict by virtue of the message that is being sent to us by the perpetrators through the way they treat their victims when they arrive. Um, and it also does not bog us down in the questions about the nature of the group, at least not initially. When life force atrocities are present, it is very likely that the perpetrators are targeting a group as a self-reproducing unit, as an organic collectivity, which is the type of group that I think the Genocide Convention was trying to identify with its historically based reference to national, ethnical, racial, and religious groups. And so the presence of life force atrocities can drastically shift our understanding of a conflict and point in new directions in terms of effective policies. Just as an example, early Serb attacks in Bosnia would not have been so easily written off as civil war plus ethnic cleansing if more attention would have been paid to the gender and relational nature of the violence on the ground immediately. Life force atrocities were present during the earliest attacks, for example, by Arkans, Tigers, and other Serb militias in eastern Bosnia. And the three years of massacre leading up to the Rwandan genocide in April 1994 would have, been, would have clearly suggested a genocidal logic within Hutu militias had we been collecting data on life force atrocities as a way of measuring the nature of those massacres. And Darfur could have been identified as a genocide with the first government-supported Janjaweed attacks on villages in the fall of 2003. Life force atrocities were present and were documented piecemeal um, at the beginning of all of these conflicts. So early warning systems operating in the short term do require that we develop as many ways as possible of identifying probable gen genocides before the violence spreads or becomes entrenched in a political system. Gender analysis, and particularly the way that it can give us access to, that it can help us see relational violence aimed at a group's generative powers. This sort of gender analysis, I believe, is one important tool for the early identifying, uh, identification of threatening genocides. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Regina Holmes. I'm um, from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Um, and I'm here today to talk about um, the Hutu extremist media propaganda that was used in Rwanda and how the effect of that in the Eastern Congo today. Um, so, in the 15 years, uh, can everyone hear me by the way? Yep, brilliant. In the 15 years since the Rwandan genocide, the collapse of the Mobutu regime and the continued plundering of the Eastern Congo, thousands of women and girls have been raped and tortured in horrific violent acts. Genocidal rape was a key tactic during the 1994 Rwandan genocide when Hutu extremist radio RTLF and propaganda magazines sexualized enemy Tutsi women and pro-democratic Hutu women who did not conform to the ideals of the extremist 
extremist Houthi citizen. In this paper, I will consider how the gendered genocide ideology has been imported into the Eastern Congo. There are two aspects to this current appropriation of genocide ideology. The first contributes to the long-term destruction of local communities, and the second helps to fuel the accompanying mediatized war. The wars in the eastern provinces of the DRC are in part born out of over a decade of conflict, failed peace agreements, poor or irresponsible leadership, and the informalization of economies and trade routes throughout the Great Lakes region. According to the International Rescue Committee, to date an estimated 5.5 million people have died of either direct or indirect consequences attributed to conflict. Key military actors include the Congolese Regular Army, who seek to reclaim state control, the Force Democratique de Liberation du Rwanda, the FDLR, the militia whose men in power are responsible for perpetrating the 1994 Rwandan genocide, the Rastas, a breakaway Hutu extremist group, the Armed Political National Congress for the Defense of the People, the CNDP, until recently led by Laurent Makunda and backed by Rwanda, its mission is to protect the Bangiomengi Tutsi from the FDLR and Maimai, sorry, Maimai ethnic militia groups, um, of which many of them are part of an armed political coalition called Paraco. These groups often switch allegiances, sometimes fighting alongside the FDLR, government army, or the CNDP. One dominant myth that war is solely the result of the 1994 Rwandan genocide dominates, giving rise to a more destructive myth that conflict is a long continuation of long-standing ethnic war. There is no doubt, nevertheless, that the full fallout of the Rwandan genocide continues to be a major destabilisation in the region, a cause of major destabilisation. Following the genocide in July 1994, up to one million Rwandan Hutu fled Rwanda under the instruction of the ex-Rwandan government, the military, the ex bar the inter militia, and their commune leaders. The ex bar and the inter regrouped and rearmed and led incursions into Rwanda, but recruited into their ranks many Bangalamengi Hutu from North Kivu and refugee Burundian Hutu. The 1996 retaliation attack on Kiveha refugee camp by the new RPF-controlled Rwandan government saw thousands killed and sparked a further humanitarian crisis which led many exiled Rwandans and Congolese to flee westward into the then, sorry, the then Zaire and other displaced Congolese to flee into Rwanda. The Army pour la Liberation du Rwanda, the Ali, became the successor of the inter and sought to reinstitute Hutu domination in Rwanda but was supplanted by the FDLR in 2001. Today, the FDLR operates through 26 cells around the world, including America, Canada, in America, Canada, and Europe. There is also a large group in Kinshasa. It claims to be a political group pushing for dialogue with the Rwanda government, yet, as we shall see later, the FDLR continues to appropriate former Rwandan Hutu extremist propaganda. On the ground, its foot soldiers have caused significant destruction in, to Congolese communities. Following negotiations between the governments of the DRC and Rwanda in 2007, both parties were to dismantle the FDR, disarm all military groups in the region, and assimilate them into the Congolese regular army. Rwanda agreed to so stop supporting armed groups, the CNDP, and secure the border between Rwanda and the DRC, which actually did not happen. Increased fighting from August 2008 onwards led to the breakdown of the Amman Peace Agreement by Nkunda in late October 2008. Nkunda accused Kabila's government army of working alongside the FDLR and Paraco and, in doing so, was failing to demobilise troops. During this time, the CNDP was accused by the international media of deliberately targeting the local civilian Hutu population. Recently, Rwanda and the DRC have renewed their agreement and Nkunda is currently under house um, arrest in Rwanda. So, Adam Jones has argued that the UN definition of genocide is gender blind and proposes instead that genocide is the actualization of 
the intent, however successfully carried, carried out, to murder in whole or in, in substantial part any national, ethnic, racial, religious, political, social, gender or economic group, as these groups are defined by the perpetrator by whatever means. Where people are targeted specifically because of their gender, Jones contends, genocide should be understood as gendercide. Rape and mutilation was a key tactic during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Raping to annihilate or to impregnate women with AIDS, thereby seeking the long-term destruction of the Tutsi community, including the death of boys and men, was evident in local communes and documented by the UN peacekeeping force, UNAMIR. Indeed, rape was so widespread that an estimated 35,000 babies of rape were born following the 100 days of genocide. In 1998, the ICTR concluded that rape and sexual violence in Rwanda in 1994 constituted genocide because there was evidence of an intent to destroy, in whole or part, an ethnic group. Rape as a tool to annihilate has been described by Beverly Allen as genocidal rape, a term that seeks to distinguish between rape and war and rape and genocide, and the horrible difference genocidal rape makes in the particular suffering it causes. And I think your paper also adds to that. Um, it has been well documented that Tutsi civilian women are imaged as accomplices of the Rwandan patriotic front, which Hutu men were to avoid and Hutu women were to despise. Um, I just actually have just some pictures from the propaganda to show you, just so you can see. So um, this is one woman who is in interest of prostitution, she's a Tutsi, that's a Hutu man, and she's essentially you know, trying on with him, but he's been warned that she's a spy. Um, and I think, well I've argued in, in, elsewhere in another paper that um, this kind of image also, I think, um, riled Hutu women who were continually told that they were more inferior to beautiful Tutsi women. Um, again, you can see how the woman is a prostitute and they are deliberately um, bringing in Unamir as a way of demonstrating that the peace agreement that was um, meant to be in process at the time of the working. Um, so, in December 2003, the ICTR judgment of the media trial stated that Rwandan Hutu extremist media, notably the radio station RTLM and magazine Kapoor, which these are from, um, portrayed Tutsi women as femme fatale who operated as seductive agents of the enemy and made, the se sorry, and made, they say, the sexual attack of Tutsi women a foreseeable consequence of the role attributed to them. RTLM and Kangura use the threat of war to instill fear into the Hutu population while at the same time prepare them for genocide. A parallel journal, Kamaran Paka, went further in April 1993 to instill fear of rape among the Hutu community. And this image is the one that you can see. So, in this cartoon, the RPF have pillaged a Rwandan village. A member of President Pabriamana's political party, the MRNDD, is stripped to his underwear and tied to a tree. Two naked women are on the ground to the left of the tree. The woman who belongs to the Hutu party, the MRD, is tied up. Sorry, the MDR, is tied up, her hands behind her back, a stake wedged through her chest. The second woman is a member of the extremist Hutu party, the CDR. Her hands are being held by an RPF soldier while his comrade rapes her. Under the caption, it reads, Blood and sex, the horrors of war attributed to the RPF. This simulation of rape, which demonised all Tutsi men, is also evident in the extremist-led government armies' military strategies. In November 1993, the UN heard that 35 people had been massacred in the Rungiri region in five locations concurrently. UN Major Brent Beardsley, who was dispatched to survey one of the massacre sites, noted that children had been murdered and that all the girls had been raped. Despite inconclusive evidence, the UN believed the massacre had been staged by the Rwandan government forces. As Beardsley recalls in the 2001 Canadian documentary Rwanda the Genocide Facts, 
Very conveniently, there was an RPF glove left lying on the ground. The RPF. I never saw them wear any gloves, and if they did wear gloves, why would they leave it laying on the ground? In addition, the government commanders who are waiting for us at the bottom of the hill all wear a red sash cord and a red rope around their waist tied, and they all carry a very large knife with a big hilt on it. And it appeared to me the more when I looked at these children's necks that they, it was a cord that had been used to strangle them, and commandos went through extensive training on how to kill people silently with them. When the ex-FAR and the Interhangway regrouped and rearmed the refugee camps around Goma in 1994-5, they continued to administer genocidal rape, and it became a tactic to terrorise Rwandan communities during incursions into the west and north of the country, as well as local Tutsi Banyalamengi populations around Goma. At the time, the mass raping of Congolese women was not discouraged by Mobutu. David Newbury notes that in supporting his old allies, Mobutu allowed the Interahamwe to, and this is quoting Newbury, continue to rape and pillage his own population, thus leading to the confrontation of the state with the Banyaramengi that triggered the larger war. The FDR's practice of ethnically targeted genocidal rape has over the years been employed by the Mai Mai and regular Congolese army and has since become what I term a militarized rape economy wherein women and our sex, sorry, where both women and sex are commodities to be seized, bought and bartered. Ethnicity becomes one of many reasons to rape, even if annihilation of a particular ethnic group is not the military's primary goal. There are two aspects to this militarised rape economy. The first concerns the survival of strategies of women and girls through prostitution, becoming military wives, or in the exchange of sex for food and other resources. The second relates to a wider economy of violence where, as feminist American Tertian states, in the transfer of assets from the weak to the strong, combatants use rape strategically to seize women's productive and reproductive labour. In the DRC, this also amounts to stealing food, water, clothing and farming equipment, even seeds, from women. Militia and soldiers often regard rape as payment for their military work and a means to climb the military ranks. Um, and I think this is particularly significant when you consider the role of child soldiers and the increased role of, of they have in raping in Eastern Congo. As in Mobutu's time, the militarised rape economy is a product of President Laurent Kabila's political leadership. A recent report by Amnesty International estimated that around 20% of rapes were now committed by the Congolese regular army. This shocking statistic demonstrates how the militarised rape economy is not a foreign military problem alone. Perhaps more worrying is the extent to which civilian men also partake in the military, militarised rape economy. Both Amnesty International and the UK's War Party Parliamentary Group for Great Lakes Region observe that rapes by civilian men, as well as by minors, are on the rise. In June 2008, UNICEF declared that in Eastern Congo, an estimated 1,000 women were being raped each month in unparalleled brutality. Although the problem of rape is recognised internationally as extreme, mass rape in the Eastern Congo continues to be understood within the framework of war, not genocide. For example, Despite adopting the vocabulary of genocide to assert that rape is often successful in its intent to destroy and exterminate and can cause the near total destruction of women, their families and their communes, communities, US-based campaign group ENOUGH state that rape is just a weapon of war. If we agree with James's term, genocide, mass rape in the Eastern Congo constitutes the actualization of intent to murder in whole or in part women and girls. The word actualization is particularly important here. As David MacDonald has indicated, a number of genocide scholars, including Helen Fine and Roger Smith, believe that a lack of intent need not detract from the reality of genocide. The problem lies in the UN Genocide Convention's assertion that the intent to commit genocide must be proven. 
Mass rape in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Yugoslavia has been recognized as genocide because it occurred where the international law decreed genocide had taken place. According to Vine, genocide can be the sustained purposeful action by a perpetrator to physically destroy a collectivity directly or indirectly. I suggest, therefore, that the current militarized rape economy, wherein multiple actors target a gender group, is the reality of genocide, even if collectively the perpetrators, both those in command and foot soldiers, do not deliberately intend to commit genocide. Eric Reeves' term to describe the wholesale destruction of African villages also helps us to understand how the militarized rape economy in the eastern Congo amounts to genocide. Lacking basic human security, Reeves writes, civilians displaced into camps or surviving precariously in rural areas face unprecedented shortfalls in humanitarian assistance, primarily food, portable water, and medical care. In the eastern Congo, the militarized rape economy generates extreme human insecurity, which is preventing women from carrying out basic economic and survival stress activities, such as going to the market, collecting water, gathering firewood and farming. Denied of this basic right to survive, the families of women, which include young boys, old or disabled men, suffer. As enough stated in March 2008, by the end of this month and every month, 45,000 more Congolese, half of them children, will die from hunger, preventable disease and other consequences of violence and displacement. Congolese women and girls in particular bear the brunt of this crisis. This is compounded by a prevailing attitude by perpetrators, particularly Congolese regular army troops, that, to quote enough, soldiers cannot be held accountable for their actions. It is the woman's fault for being raped, and women should know not to go out in places where there are armed men. Women of all ages are raped, and many die through lack of access to primary medical care and the specialist care required to repair fistulas. As in Rwanda following the genocide, women are frequently left mutilated, disabled, infected with HIV AIDS, infertile or pregnant, physically and psychologically traumatized, resulting in the long-term destruction of local communities. Perpetrators themselves, many of them former members of, the con of these Congolese communities, are also left infected with HIV AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases. So in addition to this ongoing genocidal rape, the virtualization of rape, rape, as we see here, is employed in Eastern Congo's mediatized war. The vocabulary of the Rwandan genocide is being appropriated by all sides to give credence to their political legitimacy, while at the same time condemn that of their opponents. The FDLR promote their ideology via their website, which is fdlr.org if anyone's interested, administrated in Germany and hosted on a French server. The site contains a series of press releases that bear a striking resemblance to articles published in Kinabura. In one press release published on the 22nd of May 2008, they accused the Kigali regime, the UN, and Human Rights Watch of spreading lies and the demonization of the FDLR. That's their words. Another press release issued in May 2008 claims they are a plural organization bringing together men and women of all Rwandan ethnic groups who share a common ideal. Um, that common ideal probably is quite questionable. Um, however, in other documents, women are targeted because of their ethnicity. In one, um, entitled The Truth Behind the Rwanda Tragedy, they never call it a genocide. The FDLR claim that Tutsi refugee women in Uganda worked for the Aboto government as spies in bars, hotels, restaurants, and even as wives. Despite what is happening on the ground, the FDLR have attempted to resolve itself of military rape. In May 2007, the FDLR stated that it strongly condemned acts of kidnapping women and girls by criminal groups called Rastas operating in South and North Kivu. The FDLR's European leadership is instead using rape as a political tool to justify their opposition to the current Rwandan government, which it argues is manipulating international media. In the May 2007 press release, they contend that rapes and kidnapping by Rastas 
Rasta criminal groups are part of the cynical strategy of the criminal regime in Kigali, which is putting those crimes on the back of the FDLR using media relays supporting its cause in order to tarnish their images. Okay, I've, I've no, please, 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 the greatest rape, silence, rape in the Eastern Congo, released in May 2007, the Kabila government claims that rape and sexual violence is only conducted by foreign armies, not the Congolese army. Lukunda, for his part, has been able to take advantage of the international community's continual framing of genocide and rape as a weapon of war. When challenged by American NBC journalist Anne Curry in June 2008, Lukunda argued that rape was not a CNDP military policy, but the classic byproduct of war. Let's assume, he said, that it's difficult to have control of 10,000 men. The Rwandan government, which has monopoly over the Rwandan genocide narrative, is quick to portray rape in the Eastern Congo as chaos, in spite of Rwanda's own role in the region. So despite some success, in conclusion, um, to recently um, disbanding the FDLR, um, I should say some success in recently in disbanding the FDLR. The problem of rape in the DRC is not likely to end. The international community and Kabila's government must do more to hold the perpetrators to account, to improve institutions, the justice system, and educate both men and women about women's rights. A major victory in this regard is the recent trial of Kabila's former opposition leader, Jean-Pierre Bemba, who is accused of using rape as a weapon of terror. He's currently being tried at a war crimes tribunal in The Hague for conducting a systematic campaign of rape, torture, and looting against civilians in the Central African Republic. So thank you. Hi, I'm Henry Terrio from Western State College in Massachusetts, uh, in the field of philosophy, actually, as well as one of the editors of the IAGS journal, uh, Genocide Studies and Prevention. And I'm going to uh, give some remarks on the issue of, of whether we should consider rape a tool of genocide or genocide as a tool of rape, or maybe and or is a better way to say it, if both things are true in many cases. Um, and I'm also, just for time's sake, going to assume that, because um, this is a genocide studies conference, that many of you will be you know, relatively familiar with the basic details of the Bosnian genocide, the Armenian genocide, um, and the Nanjing massacre. Um, but I do, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them to clarify that some of the background you know, might be helpful in understanding some of the finer points here. Um, since the early 1990s, rape and other sexual, uh, I'm sorry, other violence against women has become more recognized as a major violence perpetrated in genocide. Um, at the same time, two factors undermine what should be more of a growing recognition and preventative approach to mass violence against women. First, in the past decade, a subtle backlash movement um, often using the term gender side has emerged, which has tended to emphasize a different opinion there, um, tend, tended to emphasize the ways in which men are selected out for specific violence and genocide, and tended to lessen the focus on specific ways in which women are victimized in genocide. Um, second, central academic and policy work on genocide largely continues to treat violence against women as a marginal issue. Um, perhaps the most telling example is the recent highly touted genocide prevention task force preventing genocide blueprint for U.S. policymakers. In the well over 100 pages of this report, rape and gender violence are mentioned a total of three times and have no meaningful present in discussion of, uh, presence in the discussion of causes, central features, or prevention of genocide. It appears that the mainstream approach to understanding and working against genocide at best pays minor lip service to the role of rape and genocide. Um, I, just as a kind of clarification, um, I'm really talking about more than rape in that kind of narrow legal term, and I want to spell out some of the ways in which maybe we can think of harms against women um, in the context of genocide and other kinds of mass violence. Um, by rape, I mean a formal sexual, a form of sexual torture through which intercourse is forced on a woman or girl by direct um, physical force or psychological or economic threat, force, or coercion against the, the woman or girl or others to whom she has loyalty, for instance, a younger sibling, and so forth. Um, gang rape, rape by multiple perpetrators, is a frequent form in genocide. Um, there are also other forms of sexual torture that are sometimes grouped under rape, but probably we should just spell out, uh, we should keep in mind our, our go beyond that, um, you know, in terms of, of some of the things that you've mentioned um, already. Um, 
these are any other acts of violence or harm against women that either under non-force conditions might be considered sexual in nature, or target specific aspects of women's existence or bodies that perpetrators perceive to have sexual functions, um, again, by their definition. Um, I think this is important just because sometimes um, the incredible horror of, of what we're talking about in these kinds of contexts falls out because there are kind of, uh, I don't want to say, sanitized ideas of rape that often oper operate in legal um, and other contexts. Um, in addition to rape and other sexual torture, there are, I think, at least seven other harms that I kind of connect with in this, or deal with in this paper. Um, and these often overlap. The first is sexual enslavement, into which women and girls are captured, held, forced, or forced by circumstances. Second is forced impregnation, um, which is usually caused by rape, but has an additional goal beyond the specific uh, issue of rape. Um, third is fetus destruction as either a form of violence in itself, for instance, the slicing open of a living woman's abdomen to expose the fetus, um, as was frequent in the Armenian Genocide, and as we hear also in many other cases. Um, or as a mean, means of preventing live births in the target group. Fourth um, are cases in which women are put into um, positions of making what you might call Sophie's choices, for instance, deciding which children will survive, um, being forced to abandon children on a death march, for instance, in order to save other family members, or out of an incapacity to care for the child because of the degradation of, of her own circumstances, um, being forced or of course into giving a child away by circumstances or violence and so forth. Um, women and girls might also face a different kind, but also similar choice of choices, choices between, for instance, rape and suicide, um, as, ha as happened, uh, again, in certain cases. Um, six, there is forced domestic servitude, which often overlaps with these other harms. And finally, is forced marriage, which can include forced impregnation, sexual enslavement, domestic servitude, and forced religious con con uh, conversion. And, and I want to add, uh, add um, in, in kind of picking up some of the things that Georgina was talking about. I think also it's not just these acts themselves, but the, the kind of continual threat of those acts that also counts as a, as a, as a part of this um, violence against women that's very significant and plays out in ways that you were talking about. Um, in the Bosnian genocide, um, at the leadership as well as direct perpetrator levels, the role of rape in itself, and often also as a means of forced impregnation, can, see, can be seen to have, a, have had a fundamental role. The genocide took place in the 1990s and drew world attention. In the post-Cold War, uh, it was post-Cold War and Serbia's historical ties to a now weakened and actively maneuvering Russia put the United States in an oppositional position. In addition, Germany's strong historical relationship with Croatia, including support for the Croatian fascist, fascist genocide of 200,000 Serbs during World War II, exacerbated, exacerbated the dichotomy. The United States and Germany, for instance, readily recognized Croatia's secession from Yugoslavia and condemned Serbian aggression. In addition, the United Nations was developing an expanded post-Cold War, uh, Cold War role, using human rights um, to give itself renewed legitimacy and as, levers of, as a lever of intervention in various cases in the world. Pursuit of direct physical genocide on the model of the Armenian Genocide, Holocaust, or Cambodian Genocide um, was likely to trigger a drive for intervention based on, in part, on the geopolitical desire to weaken Serbia and thereby Russian influence in the Balkans and Europe more generally. By pursuing its goals of destruction of the Bosnian presence in um, putatively Serbian areas by other means, um, Serbians could complicate and to an extent evade charges of genocide, thereby forestalling intervention. In fact, this is precisely what happened. Serbian perpetrators use mass rape as an alternative to many cases of direct killing or, or the use of direct killing as widely as it might have been used otherwise. Mass rape sometimes entailed killing the victims, but was typically pursued, often in tightly organized um, rape concentration camps, with the explicit purposes of torturing Bosnian women for an extended period of time and or forcibly impregnating them. These met methods were genocidal in two ways. First, rape itself is a highly effective form of torture, that is, inflicting severe bodily and mental harm on victims. There is no need here to reverse the literature on the intertwined physical and psychological trauma rape causes, um, which is exacerbated where the rape is repeated and part of a broader process of group destruction. Through the destabilization of victims in this way, the genocide perpetrators were able to introduce this trauma as a far-reaching element in any future Bosnian society. The rape also affected others in the community in an ongoing, long-term way. Not only are concerned family members and friends themselves affected by their long-term commitment to victims who need support and whom, uh, whom the family and friends feel great sympathy toward and a sense of 
profound injustice and anger about. Um, but the presence of sexist notions of male power and responsibility meant that Bosnian men, particularly those linked to direct victims, and there were many direct victims, experienced rapist humiliation and disempowerment. Second, the process of forced impregnation served two pur purposes. It created a perpetual source of anxiety and inner conflict in women who had to contend with the memory of the origin of a child that they were forced to raise um, and its relationship to great violence and trauma, while at the same time being, um, you know, confronting a child that was in fact their own child and whose love and, and support, in some sense, they either felt um, the desire to give or a kind of social pressure to give. Just as importantly, as an, and, it, and as an explicit goal of the mass rape campaign, it changed the demographics of Bosnia. According to Serbian notions of ethnic identity, a child's identity falls as father's. Thus, children born of rapes were Serbian, despite having Bosnian mothers. Not only did this increase the Serbian population of Bosnia, whose minority Serbian population was trying to maximize its land claim on Bosnia um, after the independent declaration of independence of, of Bosnia, um, but it did so as a supplement to Serbian children born of Serbian mothers and in a way that prevented live births among Bosnian women by Bosnian fathers that would have been defined as Bosnian by the Serbians. Um, the Serbian perpetrators appear to have used math, mass rape, as I said, in an attempt to circumvent international law against genocide, which had historically, up to that point, not recognized rape as a method of genocide. If the perpetrators were ultimately wrong in the fact that some people ultimately were convicted or at least you know, uh, accused of rape as genocide, in effect, their maneuvering did work by keeping the genocide ambiguous enough for a number of years to prevent outside powers such as the United Nations um, um, from intervening and to allow the perpetrators to continue perpetrating their violence. Um, it foresaw such things as you know, the arming of Bosnians um, and, and other methods that people um, uh, thought of as a way of intervening against, um, against the genocide until, in some sense, it was too late and many people had already suffered and died. Um, eyewitness and survivor accounts of the Armenian genocide contained sickening detail after detail after detail of the intense violence against women practiced by the perpetrators. And, um, you know, uh, uh, sickly enough, you could take many of the narratives that we heard from other genocides and, and find almost, I mean, very similar kinds of experiences for Armenian women, which were just, I mean, you know, survivor account and, and eyewitness account and, and government documents after government documents. You, you see these things. Um, in the words of Hilmar Kaiser, scholar of the Armenian Genocide, um, in some sense, everything that could be done in human bodies was done in the process of, of the violence. And I would add everything that could be done in human minds. And then again, that's something that we've seen with some of the discussions so far. Um, rape is reported almost incessantly, and from accounts appears to have been virtually universal as an ongoing torture of Armenian women and girls. Reports of Armenian women and girls being taken into sexual slavery, often referred to in the literature euphemistically as being taken into harems, um, come with most every detailed report on the experiences of a deportee, caravan, or village attack. In addition, women and girls were often forced into Islam, uh, converting to Islam, and marriage, which could be seen in many cases to result in forced impregnation and ongoing rape, as I mentioned before. Sexual torture, such as genital mutilation in a whole set of uh, sick forms, was frequent. One can also add the kinds of choiceless choices that mothers had that I, that I referred to already, um, and the, the choice by some, uh, particularly adolescent uh, Armenian girls, to, to choose suicide by jumping off cliffs and drowning themselves, as opposed to um, um, experiencing almost inevitable rape that they had already witnessed in, in their experiences, and it was a very likely occurrence. Um, the only work on the Armenian genocide, to my knowledge, that explicitly discusses violence against women and girls, and this is a huge problem in the literature on the Armenian genocide, is Donald E. Miller and Lina, Lorna Torian Miller's Survivors in Oral History of the Armenian Genocide. In their pre presentation of information gained from interviews with 100 survivors of, gen of the genocide, they include much on the victimization of women and provide a very important framework for its understanding. In fact, setting aside a chapter of the experience of women and children, largely devoted to, to violence against women women and girls. Um, one episode they include somehow summarizes hundreds, perhaps thousands, of similar accounts in the, pri uh, in the primary documentation. Um, and to quote, references to sexual abuse abound in our interviews, but one of the most graphic accounts was of a young girl who was raped by one of the Turkish leaders of a town to which their caravan passed. Um, gendarmes, the, the military police, um, went through the, the caravan and found an especially pretty 12-year-old girl. They dragged her away from her mother, telling the weeping woman that they would return her. And in fact, the child was returned, 
but she had been terribly abused and later died. Um, and again, this doesn't get into the graphic details, but it gives you an idea of just 12-year-old you know, girls being subjected to this as a matter of routine um, is, is, again, horrific in the ways that these other things are as well. Um, I have argued elsewhere that the key motive behind the broad-based support for the Armenian Genocide, as well as its ideological function, was a tension between the long-standing imperial order um, formalized in the Milat system that placed Armenians in a subservient second-class status, denied basic rights, and viewed by the Muslim society as fit targets of violence, and the results of the, 19, of the 1908 revolution that installed a new Ottoman constitution that guaranteed equal rights for all residents regardless of ethnicity or religion. Turkish ultra-nationalists could not accept a truly multinational state um, and felt there was no going back, um, and, and, I'm sorry, and because there was no going back to an old imperial order that allowed a fixed hierarchy, um, the result, essentially the only option from the standpoint of the perpetrators was genocide. Um, it is, uh, but it is one thing to look at um, the structural dynamics and ideology driving genocide, these kinds of issues, and another to ask what conditions were necessary to gain broad popular participation um, in the genocide, and in fact to make the genocide possible. First and foremost, the Armenian genocide um, on the ground seems to have been motivated by a, a kind of economic uh, motivation, the, the constant expropriation of, of um, just local uh, money, homes, movable property, jewelry, um, and, and so forth. Um, and linked to this, and, and I think very importantly, there was a, a, a kind of parallel economy, and this is again is something that, that's been talked about, um, of rape and sexual slavery. Um, that is, you know, a constant idea of rape as the entitlement of the perpetrators, as, a, as something to be gained in addition to, to financial and other kinds of material wealth. Um, and also Armenian women, and particularly girls, as a commodity um, that functioned right along animals and, and um, jewelry and other kinds of things. Um, and this enrichment, um, pro this, this element of enrichment, if, if you go through the historical documentation, seems to have been crucial to the ability of the young Turk population, uh, the young Turk perpetrators, to translate its ideology of genocide into an actual execution of genocide. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it is very significant in this context. This isn't to say that the overall goal of the Armenian Genocide was to make women and girls available for rape and sexual enslavement, but it is to say that the central motivation for large number, a large number of perpetrators, um, and this includes some women in, uh, in Turkish villages, was rape and sexual enslavement and, uh, of women and girls, and so the Armenian Genocide could not have occurred without them, and thus was a function of, of rape and other forms of violence against um, the Nanjing Massacre uh, was perpetrated by the Japanese military in, in late 1937, early 1938. This was a case of genocide in which the Japanese military targeted a specific part of the Chinese population, those living in the nationalist capital of Nanjing, um, in order to try to intimidate the rest of China into, into um, stopping its resistance to Japanese military aggression. During this event, also known as the Rape of Nanjing, Japanese soldiers raped an estimated uh, 20,000 to 80,000 women. Um, the numbers, are, of course, are very difficult to come by, in part because it was almost a given that those women were then killed and could not bear witness to what had happened to them. Um, these rapes cannot necessarily be considered a goal of the Japanese government, however, and this is very, a very complicated issue. While they were certainly considered collateral acts and not particularly um, uh, admonished against or, or dealt with by any kind of um, punishment after, um, they actually ultimately were came, to, came to be seen as a problem for the Japanese military because they created a backlash attitude among Chinese civilians and military personnel that made them actually resist more strongly the Japanese aggression. Now because of that, and this is where we get the translation into, into genocide, um, because of that, the Japanese government and military could have understood that rape was a bad policy. Of course, they should have understood that from a human rights perspective, but even if they had understood it, understood it from a military expediency um, viewpoint, they might have lessened the occurrence of rape. They might have, there are a lot of easy steps they could have taken to, to prevent or, or, or lessen the occurrence of rape um, by their soldiers. But contrary to that, what they actually did um, was to operate, they operated on a sexist belief that the rapes were the discharging of a natural sexual desire um, among the soldiers that had not been satisfied because the soldiers were far from home and thus had none of the usual women available to satisfy their sexual urges. Since the urges were considered natural and fundamental, um, they had to be discharged, so the soldiers turned to raping women in and around Nanjing. 
The solution was a dramatic systemization. Uh, the, the Japanese government's solution then was not to deal with that, that issue and their own false understanding of what rape actually was, but instead to dramatically systematize and expand the so-called comfort women uh, uh, program that they had originally begun in 1931. Starting in 1938, the Japanese military developed an extensive system of fixed camps in which they forced a total of about 200,000 um, girls, and I say girls because the average age was mid-teens, in which these, these um, victims were forced into sexual slavery, um, from Korea, China, the Philippines, and other Asian areas conquered by Japan, as well as some Dutch women caught in Indonesia. Um, I won't get into the issues. These women were subjected to extreme violence and, and degradation. They were often um, housed in these stall-like rooms where they would be raped sometimes 30 times a day. Um, it was very carefully organized. Japanese government used a ticket system, which the soldiers paid for. They had a schedule. They rotated different troop groups in and out. Um, and uh, the level of violence against these women, I mean, it was, you know, every, you know all sorts of kinds of torture. Um, men were often drunk or just, you know, uh, 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 kind of coming from the battlefield and, and, and in a sense of uh, committing incredible violence. Um, much has been written about the denial by Japanese governments from 1945 to the present about the system and the impact on the survivors as well as their heroic quest for justice. What has not been analyzed in depth is the real connection to the Nanjing Massacre and what it applies for our understanding of genocide and mass violence against women. Um, while Japan engaged in mass killings after the Nanjing Massacre, the fact that its leaders build the, viewed the expanded comfort women system as a result of the massacre highlights the deep function of the system. The system represented the military's attempt to achieve total control and determine the structure of violence that went beyond military goals such as conquest of territory, control of sea and ocean areas, and so forth. The comfort women system um, was highly organized, and in this way, the Japanese military transformed chaotic violence of, of the Nanjing Massacre variety, um, which it objected to because it interfered, it interfered with its military goals, um, into a perfectly controlled, commanded, systematized violence that was even routine in time and locations. I mean, we can fix here, I think, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I'm from Uganda, and um, I've experienced much of what you, <laughs> you know, exactly as you have stated it. But I want to express myself to, and I've lived through three wars, and uh, for I'm 40 years over, and for the last 40 years, Uganda has not had a day without war, fought, it, not even one day. So you can talk about genocide as episodes, 94. You can talk about genocide as a continued process that is calculated. Those remain academics. But I want to speak my, to the issue of the early warning that you talked about. Uh, probably to suggest that much as we are discussing genocide as process and how it executed, we should also look at the preventive aspect and discuss it in the context of what is it, what conditions occasion that mindset, where does it come from. The soldiers that attacked Rwanda in 1991 came from Uganda. Mm -hmm. What is it about President Museven that we should have known, that could have, and his team, because they came together, they fought, captured power, organized, and crossed into Rwanda. Finished there, organized, went into Congo. What is it about him that we should have learned? What precipitating conditions prevailed to create that mindset? If it is rape, is the rape in Rwanda or Uganda, Northern Uganda, Congo, was it greater statistically than in Bosnia? And could culture have played a part? And if it does, is there a way that we can talk to people about their cultures so that people don't look at rape as an immediate option because of their cultural background? 
are there ways that I'm, I'm trying to look at, at that. I'm trying to look at, because I come from Uganda and we have discussed all these issues, child soldiers and so on. And at some point, somebody say, why are you spending your time on symptoms? There is a cause. What, how do child soldiers become child soldiers in the first place? Who recruits them and why? What conditions do exist? Why do people, you know? So I would, to talk about prevention is the fact that uh, as much as we are discussing this, and I've had stories, I've had stories like one you mentioned, you know, where a woman was stabbed, you know, in, in the stomach, and, and the, the kid came out, and, you know, they played with the kid, and, you know. In northern Uganda, what Kone does when he recruits kids, sends them to the village by force to kill first, that's the initiation process, so that they can't go back. You know, they already have a case there, and, you know. So, we should look at the conditions. If it's leadership, let us look at the leadership also that mobilizes, that, that instigates, that, 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 that disproportionately um, serve communities, that that, you know, that, that creates the boundaries and the divides. Because there is one that is brewing now in, 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 in the Great Lakes region that, that people have not studied. In Uganda, for, the, for about 25 years, actually 35 or 25, the power of the gun was in northern Uganda. So they dominated the power. The President Museven and the West organized, recruited people from the central. They went into the bush. The economy was weak. There were many conditions aground that favored them within five years, and they took over power. Now, the power of the gun has to be shifted to break, to stop them from organizing to come back. You cannot say that within 20 years, you, f you fight a government and take over power in five years. Five with handguns. You have 25 years with the biggest army in history, the biggest budget in history, a, a national mandate as an elected president, and experience, because President Museveni was a mercenary in Fronasa, he came into, you know, and all this. And 25 years you can't win in insurgents in two districts, two districts in northern Uganda, two districts. But in the meantime, you send a peacekeeping force in Somalia, you support Rwanda government to change, you go 2,000 kilometers in Congo, you are in Burundi, and two districts in Uganda are still at war. So. Somebody conveniently leaves them there to cripple them, no school, no health, no education, and so on. But the pendulum will swing back someday. And those people will have to pay back. So there is already a divide in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm saying is that we need to look at those conditions. And when we are studying that, the, 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 the genocide, I like the prevention, I like the early warning that, that you actually mentioned, that if we look at that, while we are starting to fix what has been done in the past, we can prevent others which are coming. Because that is a setup in Uganda, just briefly to tell you, you know, he's supporting groups in Darfur and so on. So that is a setup of something that is growing so terribly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that this long-term piece is extremely important, and that's where some of the most important work can be done is ultimately it's better to fully prevent right, genocidal conflicts or conflicts in, 
in general than have to intervene after the big start is out. Um, so I think that's very important. I think looking at the leadership and where they're trained and, and uh, their, their past is also extremely important. If you look at Fode Sanko and Charles Taylor, they were trained in Liberia and Sierra Leone. They were trained in the same camps that some of the original Janjaweed militias were trained in in Libya, Muammar Gaddafi's training camp. So there's often a link like that, I mean, a direct link between similar types of violence being pursued by the leadership. And then this cultural piece as well, I'm sure Jujia can speak to that, but that is extremely important to um, raise awareness of right, the problem of violence against women and the way that that can contribute to the actual sort of, um, beginnings of conflict. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I mean, one of my, what, what I think about the Eastern Congo is um, with this peace process and the need to um, demobilize the FDLR and integrate troops into the current Congolese government, uh, sorry, Congolese army. The fact that um, more and more civilians and miners are raping shows that it has become a cultural thing. It's a militarized society. We need to demilitarize the civilian society. And that, that has to happen. That's the problem, I think, in the Great Lakes region. And I think one of the difficulties is that even in, in countries where it's peaceful, as such, for example, Rwanda, the reality of Rwanda is that there's still a military government. They still think in terms of a military force. And that's the problem, I think, in the Great Lakes region. And that's what we need to somehow, you know, tackle. Yeah, I would only add, um you know, unfortunately, I'm mean, we'll talk about the Armenian genocide as a forgotten genocide of the 20th century, but I often think Cambodia is really the forgotten genocide. It's not, yeah. it's not in people's consciousness. Uh, you know, I've been to so many, you know, Jeff Armenian genocide, Holocaust, Rwanda, and so forth, but it has a very small presence in the overall kind of scheme of how people deal with genocide. And that's a place where, and I, and I you know, know of people in Massachusetts, for instance, and one I, I, I saw who was, uh, you know, giving a talk uh, on a panel with, who was a child soldier, recruited by the Khmer Rouge, went through the indoctrination, explained that whole process as a you know, 10 year old kid, maybe younger, I can't remember. Um, you know, I started when I was seven, and it's exactly that process. That happened 30 to 35 years ago, and it's well documented. There are survivors of that who are testifying about that, and yet it has almost no presence in how we're understanding you know, the same thing that's happening again. So if you talk about causes, that's a, you know, that, we should be doing better. I mean, the, you know, researchers have, have talked about this. People are writing about this. But nobody's taking it very seriously. And yet we're seeing exactly the same process. I mean, I should say exactly the same process. But a strikingly similar process. I mean, a certainly similar process um, of indoctrination and, and so forth. And so how do we take what we, I mean, I hate to say what we know, but I mean, what we witness in this kind of basic historical information that we have and analysis that we have and translate that into dealing with these problems? That you're exactly right that we need to do that. Um, but I would say intellectually it's not that complicated because we're already, people have already got a sense of what, what's going on. It's a matter of actually stopping it. So. Yeah. <laughs>